in the book of Hebrews. But before we jump in, I just want to let you guys know, we're going to take a break um, from next week for uh, a couple of weeks, uh, and we're going to spend some time uh, looking at, drum roll, uh, your finances. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Everyone was super excited. It was like, yeah, finances, what, wait, why? Um, yeah, we're going to spend some time looking at uh, finances, the topic uh, uh, on money and how we are called to manage our money. And it's gonna be a super practical uh, teaching series. I'm encouraging you guys to come because I believe that it's gonna help you. It's gonna unlock some things in you uh, to be able to handle your money so that your money doesn't handle you. Um, because the call is to be generous. God calls us, Ed already mentioned it to us, God calls us to be generous. But I believe one of the many reasons, one of the many reasons uh, that we are not generous is because we are not handling our finances well. Whether it's because you're living beyond your means, whether it's because you have three different credit cards and they're all owing tons of money, it's okay, all right? It's okay. We're coming in uh, for a couple of weeks to sort that, that out, to talk about it. And then we're going to land the plane with a Lakotla on the 1st of July. That's a Saturday. It'll be over here in the morning. And, and then just we're going to talk a little bit more about that and get really, really, really practical. We're going to talk about investments. We're going to talk about uh, how you should be managing your tax and how you can save on that. Uh, what does saving actually look like, right? So these next couple of weeks, I really think are going to be incredible. Because, because here's the thing. Uh, we're told to get a license before we uh, drive, right, to get in a car. But it's weird how nobody ever tells us that we need a license to handle money. And I think we should. I really think we should. We should get a license before we get credit cards. But that's not how the world works. In fact, I, I don't know about you, but I, I was never taught how to budget, at all, I had to figure it out like as I was doing it and in the beginning it was not good. Uh, but thankful for my wife um, who helped me out, try to understand Excel spreadsheets. Um, so, so we're gonna be talking about all those things from a kingdom perspective. God's not afraid to talk about money. Jesus was not afraid to talk about money. And so we should not be afraid to talk about money. In fact, people who generally are not afraid about talking about money are generous people. And that's because generous people have a handle on their money. Their money is not handling them. All right, so that's what we're going to do over the next couple of weeks. And so I'd encourage you to come uh, to those Sunday gatherings, invite your friends. I'm sure you guys know many people who are horrible with their money because they're always asking you for money, all right? And they just never pay it back. They promise, but they never pay it back. Um, so invite them and, and tell them we're going to talk about money. Uh, and then, no spoiler alert, we're going to talk about Jesus as well um, because he's the one... Uh, that fuels us uh, and gets us to be able to handle that money well. All right? Amen. Is that cool? Yeah. Great. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 9 to 20 is where we'll be. Let me pray and then we'll jump into the text. Father, thank you so much for your word. Uh, these are old words, but they're not dead words. They're very much alive. And so, God, I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit uh, that you would open up our hearts so that we might see you for who you are. God, we love you. We praise you. Every single person in here is in desperate need of a Savior. His name is Jesus. And so would we have a powerful encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. In your beautiful name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, now, last week was rough. If it wasn't rough for you, it was rough for me. We walked through three big warnings that the writer of Hebrews put before us. We spoke about immaturity. We spoke about ambiguity. We spoke about forgery, a forgery that leads to apostasy. There were three big warnings. But now the writer of Hebrews transitions from warnings to encouragement. Because I, I, if you're like me, if I was sitting and listening or reading, I'd go, man, this is intense. I'd be like self-evaluating and wondering, am I a Christian? Am, am I immature? Like, what's going on? And so he feels the need to move from warnings to encouragement. In the end of chapter 5 and the first half of chapter 6, he rebukes them, warning them quite intensely for their lack of growth in Christ. But now he begins to encourage them. He begins to encourage us. You see, they needed a slice of humble pie. Some needed the whole pie. But now he wants to build them up. He writes and believes 
that they can do better, that they can and will grow and live out an abundant life, one that is filled with fruit. That's what he says to them, and that's what he's going to say to us this morning. You see, correction requires that you first show the error of someone's ways. Then, after that, it requires showing them what they should do or who they should be. And we see this in Scripture over and over and over again, this this dual teaching, what you should not do and then what you should do. A good leader should not only give those they lead negative feedback, like rebukes and criticism and discipline. No, no, no. They should also seek to compliment and build up those that he is leading. They should praise them when they do well. They should try to give them a vision of how to reach their full potential while always motivating them to aim higher. That's a good leader. And that's what the writer of Hebrews does here. So let me read verses 9 and 12. We landed the plane last week with these verses, but but let me start with them. It says, even though we are speaking this way, dearly loved friends, in your case, we are confident of things that are better and that pertain to salvation. For God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you demonstrated for his name by serving the saints and by continuing to serve them. Now, we desire each of you to demonstrate the same diligence for the full assurance of your hope until the end, so that you won't become lazy, but will be imitators of those who inherit the promises through faith and perseverance. Now, I don't know how I can better communicate with passion and conviction what you could achieve by the grace of God if you truly lived in the full assurance of the hope that is found in Christ. I I cannot stress that enough. How deeply you could enjoy the blessings of being a child of God if you were living in the full assurance of your hope in Christ. I I can't stress that enough. Let me turn that around and say the same thing in different terms. God wants you to know that you belong to him. His desire is for every one of his blood-bought children to be gripped and captivated by the certainty of the hope that we have in Jesus. That's what he wants for us. He, He wants you to rest in the full assurance of that hope so that you will live out of the overflow of his love for you. He wants you to rejoice in the assurance of that hope so that you can have and live the abundant life. Jesus says the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I come to give life and life to the full. He he wants you to have the abundant life. Having said that, I know that nothing can be more crippling for a Christian's walk and passion and joy like fear anxiety, and uncertainty regarding your relationship with God. Let's be honest. Nothing can be more crippling than that. To to wonder, to wonder, does God love me? Is he for me? When you get up each day wondering whether or not God is there, it's hard to find desire and strength to resist temptation and live wholeheartedly for Jesus if you're always wondering, if you're always questioning, if you're always unsure. Do you know how hard it is? But when your heart is filled to the brim and dare I say begins to overflow with the assurance that your hope will not disappoint and that your relationship with God is unshakable, then there is no limit to the joy and satisfaction and spiritual abundance that you can experience. Friends, that's what I want for you. That's what I want for you. I want you to have the abundant life, but but for that to happen, you must be anchored in Jesus. 
That's what the author of Hebrews is saying in verses 9 to 12. And then in his grace, right? So, so God is going, I want this for you. I want this for you. And then, and then in his grace, God gives us his word, a vow, a guarantee, an oath that what he is saying is true, that what he is promising on he will deliver. He, he gives us a promise. He goes, guys, I, I, want, I want you to have the abundant life. And for those who are in Christ, there is, there is so much more so much more than you could ever imagine. I want that for you. And I give you my word. See, the point of the oath is to emphasize and ensure as much as possible that what is being stated is valid. That's the point of an oath. An oath is something of an exclamation mark after the promise. If God says to us, I love you more than you could ever imagine because of the finished work of my son, Jesus Christ. I will be with you every step of your life here on earth until you come to be with me or Jesus returns, whichever one comes first. If he says to us, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit and therefore I will never leave you nor forsake you. If he says these things to us, how do we know that we can believe him? If God says this to us, how can we take his word for it? How do we know that he won't break his promise? Verse 13. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater to swear by, he swore by himself. I will indeed bless you and I will greatly multiply you. And so after waiting patiently, Abraham obtained the promise. See, to, to show us, to show us that, that, that God is a God of his word, the author of Hebrews points us to Abraham. And so if he's going to point us to Abraham, then we should go to Abraham. And so Genesis chapter 12 tells us that God called Abraham. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 says that the Lord said to Abram, that was his name before he changed it to Abraham, Go from your land, your relatives, and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse anyone who treats you with contempt. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Man, what a calling. What a calling. See, we get the call and the promise here in these verses. Verse four, so Abraham went great, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. And Lot went with him. Why, why was Lot with him? That, that, that was not the instruction. The, the, and I like the fact that the Lord here doesn't reprimand him. Right? Doesn't reprimand him. In fact, Scripture tells us, so Abraham went as the Lord told him. But why is Lot with you? God told Abraham to leave his relatives. L leave your native country. Leave your relatives. But Lot went with him. See, Lot was Abraham's nephew, the son of his dead brother, Haran. Abraham's father had initially taken Lot into his care. And so it would seem only loving for Abraham to take over what his father had started. I, I, that's how I would think. But that being the case, God gave the promise to Abram and his descendants, not to Lot. In fact, if we continue to read, N Lot never really embraced God's promise to Abram. In fact, Lot would cause Abram a lot of trouble over and over and over again. Whether it was because of greed taking the better land, or whether it was because Abraham had to now go rescue Lot because he got himself in trouble. Like, he was just a lot of trouble. <laughs> Lot, friends, I'm glad you caught that one. I was going to sneak it in, and I thought, oh, 
Lot, Lot did nothing to assist Abram in his quest for God's promise, but contributed to making it difficult to obtain. See, this can be the case when we add to God's instructions, when we add to God's call, when we add to God's command to you. We clearly know what God is calling us to do. And we are willing to obey, but we need to add to what he said. And so my question to you this morning is, do you have a lot in your life? Is, is there someone that's in your life and you, and you know, you know this person is not supposed to be in my space? Like, I'm not saying be mean. Don't be mean. But you know, it's a lot. <laughs> that person is a lot. And, and, you, and you find yourself dating this person and, you, and you'll add, you'll add all, all the things, all the things. But you know, you know God has not called you to that person. Some of you have friends that are lots in your life. They're not good for you. And you can come up with tons of excuses. I'm sure Amon was like, you know what, I just, I just need to continue what my father was doing. That's a good thing. And it is. Or maybe he was going, you know what, I'm an old man. It'd be nice to have a young man with me to be able to help with the work. Makes sense. But that's not what God said. Yeah. And, and many of us, we, we're, we're like, you know, but I need this, I need this, I need... You know what it's, it's revealing? It's revealing that you actually don't trust God. Yeah. You don't trust Him to be there for you. You don't trust Him to provide for you. You don't trust Him that He will protect you. And so you've got to add, you've got to add these things. But it's a lot. And it'll keep you, it'll keep you from experiencing the, just the, the fullness and the beauty of who God is and what he wants for you. But anyway, after Lot and Abraham separated, this is in Genesis 13, he, he, gets, he, he, he gets the better land, right? Lot picks the better land. And so I'm assuming Emma's just going, well, maybe that was the land. that I was Like, what am I supposed to do now? Here's what God says to him. Genesis 13 from verse 14 says, look, look from the place where you are. Look north and south, east and west, for I will give you and your offsprings forever all the land that you see. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth so that if anyone could count the dust of the earth, then your offspring could be counted. Get up and walk around the land through its length and width for I will give it to you. And so even when Abraham's thinking, you know what, like I've, I've truly messed up, oh, God is still gracious. And that might be you this morning going, you know what, I've messed up. I've messed up. But I want you to hear God is still gracious. God is still gracious. So Abraham moved his tent and went to live near the Oaks of Mamre at Hebron, where he built an altar to the Lord. Now, after being in the land a couple of years, and still with no children, on one fateful day, while suffering from post-battle fatigue and defending the land from four kings, you can go read about it in Genesis 14, Abraham drifted off to sleep when suddenly God spoke to him. And he says, do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward will be very great. And, and then listen to Abram's response. Lord God, what can you give me since I am childless? Like that's, that's the response to God going, your reward will be very great. What can you give me since I'm childless? You, you have given me no offspring. It's just a, it's a heart that, 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 that grumbles and complains. It's a heart that does not trust God. Ask, the Christ that we serve must be bigger than the circumstances that we find ourselves in. We, we must. We must have a bigger view of who Jesus is so that we can navigate through our circumstances. I'm not saying that, like, just forget about your circumstances. No. You still need to get up from here get into your car and go live your life. 
but I want you to do that with a view of Christ who loves you more than you could ever imagine and, and, and is all powerful. Abram is at his lowest here. That's why he communicates this way. He just, he just feels defeated. Have you ever felt defeated? You've been waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. You just feel defeated. That's where Abram is. And even in that place, God still speaks to him. Gosh, we have a loving God, a gracious God, a merciful God. That even at your lowest, when, when you've got your fist in the air, God still speaks to you. He says, now the word of the Lord came to him. This one will not be your heir. Instead, one who comes from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look at the sky and count the stars. If you're able to count them, then he said to him, your offspring will be that numerous. God just doubles down on the promise that he made. He's like, I can see, I can see you're going through a lot, but you know what? I said what I said. And so if I said what I said, then I'm going to do it. And then, listen to this. Abraham believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. Oh, I love that. Abraham believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. He believed that he would become a father, and that his offspring would have children, and that his line would go on and on like the visible stars. He believed, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Abraham rested everything on God's word. That, that's what happened here. He rested everything on God's word. As a result, he was declared righteous. Righteous apart from works. This is 14 years before circumcision that we see in Genesis 17 and long, long before the, the law that came through Moses. God then makes a blood covenant with Abraham. And we can see this in Genesis 15 verses 9 to 21. See what... The practice back then was if you were going to make a promise, you would take some animals, I won't go into detail, you can go read about it, you'd take some animals, you'd cut them in half, and then the blood would spill, kind of flow, you'd lay them there, and then flow to the middle, and then uh, whoever you're making a covenant with, you'd take them hand by hand, and then you'd kind of walk through that blood, and you say, you know what? If any one of us breaks this promise, we will be like these animals here, and our blood will flow. That's how serious they took promises. And here, in Genesis 15, when the evening came, God appeared in the form of a smoking fire pot and flaming torch that passed between the pieces of animal. But Abraham had fallen into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Man, we could go into so much there. Therefore, God alone passed through the pieces of dead animals, and the covenant was sealed by God alone. Nothing depended on Abraham. Everything depended on God, who promised to be faithful to his covenant. What God did is he says, you know what? I know you're going to break this promise. I, I, like, I just, I know it. I know you're going to break this promise. And so you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to walk there alone on your behalf because you know what? I will never break my promise. Fast forward. Abram and Sarah finally get their dream in baby Isaac. Not without some bumps and bruises along the way, right? Some major potholes, uh, go, go read about it. And in their little boy, who would grow up to be a young man, they saw the promise in full bloom. However, there was one more test awaiting the old man's faith. Abraham was well over 100 years old at this point, according to Genesis 22, when God said to him one day, take your son, he said, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Uh-oh. Now, easily, this is probably the most shocking command ever given to any human by God. I mean, can you imagine the horror that filled Abraham's heart? This makes 
his ready obedience almost as equally shocking, if not more, because of what we are told in verse 3. Abraham got up early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took with him two of his young men and his son Isaac. He split wood for a burnt offering and set out to go to a place God had told him about. How, how, how could he do this? Like, I want, I want to, please, like, 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 put yourself there. How? How could anyone do this? No negotiating. Like, I would have negotiated. I would have gone, God, God, hold on, hold on. Let's talk about this a little bit. Let's talk about, like, what, what's going on? Don't, don't you remember? Don't, don't. God, let's take it a little bit, st- step further. God, don't I deserve? How could you ask this of me? Don't I deserve? Am I not, am I not better than, than so-and-so? Have I not worked harder than so-and-so? Why are you asking this of me? That would have been me. And, and yet we're told, Abraham just did what the father said. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there to worship. Then we'll come back to you. Now, guys, I know we've read this over and over and over and over again. But, but, but just for, for, come with me for a little bit. Imagine that you're, you're hearing this for the first time. You're reading this for the first time. You'd be like, wait, 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 wait. The boy and I will go over there to worship. Then we'll come back to you. Two things are happening here. He says that, that, that we're going to go worship. Now, now, why does he say that? Well, I get it, you know, burnt offerings. Yes, that's worship. But, but, but let's take it a little bit further. Let's go deeper, right? The author of Hebrews wants us to go a little bit deeper. So, 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 so why, why, why worship? Well, it's because obedience is worship. I'll let, I'll let that one sit for a little bit. Yeah, yeah you, can, you can do that. You can do that. I'll take, I'll take the clap. Uh, obedience is worship. You know what we've done today? Like, we've, we've isolated worship to be, you know, the first, like, three, four songs, depending on how the vibe is, like that's worship, and then the song we sing at the end. Or maybe when I'm sitting in my car, or when I wake up early in the morning, and I put on my earphones, and I'm listening to like my favorite worship, like, like that's worship, and then that's it. Failing to recognize that, no, 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 obedience, obedience to what God calls us to do is worship. So when you serve, you are worshiping. When you share your faith, you are worshiping. When you make disciples, you are worshiping. When you practice hospitality, you are worshiping. When you give generously, you are worshiping. Obedience is worship. Now let's go a little bit further. I feel like y'all aren't hearing me today. When you forgive someone, someone who has hurt you, who has deeply pained you, and, and you forgive, that is worship. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, we've, got, we've got to see it like that. If our lives are going to make any sense, if we are going to live the abundant life, we have to see it that way. That obedience is worship. Amen. And then he says, and then we will come back to you. Abraham was confident that they would return together. Yeah. How? How? It's because he goes back to the promise. He said, I, I, God, I remember what you said. I mean, the writer of Hebrews makes mention of this in chapter 11. Verse 17 to 19 says this way. It was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Abraham, who had received God's promises, was ready to sacrifice his only son Isaac, even though God had told him, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. And in a sense, Abraham did receive his son back from the dead. He believed. Like, think about it from, like, how else? Because Abraham's going, you know what? I I am going to sacrifice my son. 
It's going to happen. And yet God said something else. So what does that mean? He's going to raise him from the dead. That's the only option. That's the only option. Abraham believed that God would bless him through Isaac, giving him offspring as numerous as the stars, and that he was sure God would resurrect his son. Because of it, he was sure, God will resurrect my son. Let me try to take you there. The, the, The heartbreaking exchange between father and son as they ascended Mount Moriah. Isaac beginning to realize that he was the sacrifice. The the building of the altar. Isaac's voluntary submission to his old father as he was being bound. Man, I I hope you 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 can see the gospel here. Like it's slowly breaking through. His willingness. He he could have outpowered his father. Make a run for it. But he too recognizes what's going on and he goes, okay, then let us go worship. The hugging, the tears, the terrible blade in the father's trembling hand, the darkness, the deep breathing of his only son. I can only imagine emotions, the emotions that that Abraham was filled with as he sought out to faithfully carry out God's will. Then with the blade in the ready position to descend on Isaac's body, the angel of heaven called, Abraham! Abraham! And then we know the rest of the story and its beautiful redemptive glory. I hope you see that in the story of Abraham and Isaac is a beautiful picture of the gospel. That that God sent his one and only son to come and live the life that you and I should have lived, but could not. The promises that you and I break every day. God, I'll I'll do better this time. God, I'm gonna change. God, I'm gonna trust you. God, I'm going to be obedient to you, and we fail. And so Jesus comes and lives that life and then dies the death that you and I deserve. And with Jesus, there was no, stop, hold on. The blade went all the way and pierced his body. This is why we say that his body was broken for us and his blood was shed for us. It's a beautiful picture of the gospel. And already, already God, God's in, like all the way back in Genesis, he's going, I'm going to make a promise. I'm going to make a promise that, that I will come for you. I will redeem you. I will forgive you. And I will bring you back home. And we see it already here in Genesis. Let's go back to the final words of the angel of the Lord. Because it has everything to do with our text in Hebrews this morning. Genesis 22 from verse 15 to 18 says, Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn. This is the Lord's declaration. Because you have done this thing and have not withheld your only son, I indeed bless you and make your offspring as numerous as the stars of the sky and the sand of the seashore. Your offsprings will possess the city gates of their enemies and all the nations of the earth will be blessed by your offspring because you have obeyed my command. But it's these words, by myself I have sworn. See, the significance of this is from the perspective of the writer of Hebrews, is is that God repeatedly promised Abraham that he would make him a great nation. He repeatedly said to him, I'm gonna make you a great nation, I'm gonna make you a great nation. He even here swore an oath. 
Hebrews chapter 6, verse 13 and 14 tell us. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater to swear by, he swore by himself. I will indeed bless you and I will greatly multiply you. And so after waiting patiently, Abraham obtained the promise. He said he would do it and he did it. He said he would do it and he did it. That, that's why the writer of Hebrews, Hebrews points us back to Abraham because he's like, look, I want to show you. I want to show you that you can take God at his word. All the way back in Genesis. The fact that we are here, you and me, the fact that we are here is because God said we would. Verse 16 of Hebrews 6, for people swear by something greater than themselves. And for them, a confirming oath ends every dispute. Because God wanted to show his unchangeable purpose even more clearly to the heirs of the promise, that's you and I. He guaranteed it with an oath so that through two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to seize hope, seize the hope that is set before us. Now, this reads a little wonky in the Christian Standard Bible, and that's the translation that I like to preach out of, right? But I, I get it. It reads a little wonky, and so permit me to read it to you in the English Standard Version. It says, for people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes, an oath is, the, is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have a strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. So this begs the question, what is it that God wants us to see here so that we can take him at his word? The unchangeable character of his purpose. The unchangeable character of his purpose. The unchangeable character of his purpose. And so what is, what is the purpose? Oh, I'm glad you asked. You see, we've already seen the answer to this over and over again in the book of Hebrews. If you've been tracking with us, then, then you would remember. See, back in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3, he called it a great salvation. Also included in the purpose of God is bringing the whole of creation under our authority as it was in the beginning. This we saw in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 to 9. There's more. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 to 18, God's purpose is to set us free from the fear of death by, by making a way for us, propitiation, which simply means a price that satisfies. In Hebrews chapter 4, this purpose is described as the provision and experience of eternal rest for God's people. And then we will see it later in Hebrews chapter 11 to 13, that this purpose is finally fulfilled when we experience the f fulfillment of our salvation in the new heavens and the new earth, what we call the doctrine of glorification. Amen. That's the purpose. Amen. The unchangeable character of his purpose. Nothing's gonna change this, nothing. No scheme of man, not even Satan, and he tried. He tried. In our household, we call Satan a double loser. He lost twice. Jesus said, he says, I, I saw Satan fall like lightning. That's when he lost in heaven. And then he loses again when Jesus rose from the grave. Yeah. Nothing is going to change God's purpose. Amen. The unchangeable character of his purpose, so that by two unchangeable things, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. What, what are these two unchangeable things? If anything, if, 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 guys, if you, if you learn anything from me, it's this, to ferociously ask the scriptures questions. Read something and go, what does it mean? God, what does this mean? 
Like, some of us, we just read, you know? We're just like, oh, yeah, 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 and have no understanding. Don't become lazy in your understanding. We saw this last week. So, so what, are, what are these two unchangeable things? Well, the first unchangeable thing is the promise itself. God doesn't promise the way that we do. And I'm so thankful he doesn't. Because we can barely keep our own. I mean, New Year's resolutions. Okay, I won't go there. (coughs) Askis, guys. Sorry, sorry. The first unchangeable thing is the promise itself. God, God is infinitely powerful. Infinitely truthful. Infinitely resourceful. Infinitely wise. And infinitely committed to bringing your salvation to complete satisfaction. He is committed to that. God said it and therefore he will do it. And friends, that alone should be enough. The fact that God said it should be like, you know what? Enough. If God said, like, like I want to have Abraham's heart. He, he, he said it. And so even though he's calling me to do something, it's, it's not that it's taking away. He, he's just going to do things differently in your life. Why? Because he's, he's infinitely more resourceful than us. He knows way more than us. Do you know how many times, do you know how many times I've missed out on what God wants to do? Because it's like, no, 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 I heard the promise, but God, my circumstances don't really look like, so you know what I'm going to do? Let me try to add. Let me try to do things on my own. Let me try to hustle here. And God looks at us and goes, what are you doing? What are you doing? Like, you think the only way to have a family is this way. Is that the only way? I've got plans for you. Friends, and I know that this is like one of those, it's a, it's a tough one, it's a tough one. But, but you do know that singleness is a gift. And, and I don't know if it's, if, if it's on us, then, then, then shame on us, us married folk who, who treat marriage like it's this thing that you know what, it's an upgrade to life. Is it different? Absolutely. Absolutely. But it's not an upgrade. It's a gift. And, and God, God generously and graciously gives us so many gifts. But will you trust him? Or are you going to try to figure it out on your own? I'm telling you, it does not end well. It does not end well. And so that alone should have been enough. The fact that God said, hey guys, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to set in motion a plan. I'm going to rescue you by sending my son Jesus. Come live the life you should have lived. Die the death you deserve. You know why I keep repeating this? I know some of you sometimes are like, oh, he says it all the time. It's because we're forgetful. It doesn't take too long before you're like, you know what? Actually, I'm actually a pretty good person. I'm actually not that bad. Do I really need the blood of Jesus today? I think I got this, Jesus. And you may not say that, right? Because I'm mature. You know what? But your life is revealing it. It's revealing it. That is why, me, I'm on repeat. Hoping, hoping that, that, that one day it's just going to make sense to you. Like you're sitting here and you're just going to go, what? Because that's what happened to me at the age of 19. Yeah, I'd heard about Jesus. But something happened where the Holy Spirit just got a hold of me. And I went, he did what? For who? I don't have to work for it. Abundant life. And all I have to do is keep my eyes fixed on him. Why would anybody not surrender their lives to Jesus? It's because we live in a world that finds that confusing. Some people refer to it as as the upside down kingdom of God. I don't think the kingdom of God is upside down. I think we are upside down. And so when you come to Christ, all of a sudden you're like, I've been living my life upside down. And then when you engage with society, you, you, you now see it's like, that is so upside down. What I believed about relationships, it's so upside down. What I thought about money, so upside down. His word should be enough for us. Yeah. Amen. Amen. But because God is so gracious, he gives us more. He gives us more. The second unchangeable thing. It's the oath. 
It's the oath. God first promises and then he swears by it. He says, I will, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will finish in you the work I began when you first surrendered your life to Jesus. And not only that, I swear to you by my own name, by my own name, that what I have promised is true. And since there was no one greater to swear by, he says, I took an oath by my own name. He looks around, he looks around, and he goes, who, who, could, who could I give this over to? Like, like the, the, what do they call it? Is it sh- surety? Yeah, 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 surety. Pro- proxy. Sh- surety. Guys, accounting was super bad for me at, at, in, in, in university, really bad. Sure. Like, like when you take out a loan, they'll be like, okay, so who, uh, do, you have a, yeah, yeah, do you have a life policy for this? Because, uh, look, we, if you can't make the payments. And so we, we life policies, we get insurance. If you're still a minor, then your folks will sign on your behalf. And so God looks around and goes, well, there's no one here. Then I will, I will take an oath in my own name. But here's the point, friends. Here's the point. God, who makes the promise and swears the oath, cannot lie. That, that's the point of the whole sermon. And some of you are going, then why did you have to preach that long? Why didn't you just tell us that in the beginning? Because you guys dressed really, really nice, and so I wanted to make it worth it. God, who makes the promise and swears the oath, cannot lie. That's the point. That's the word of encouragement. And so, because of this, the author of Hebrews writes in verse 19, we have this hope as an anchor for our soul. Firm and secure. We have this hope as an anchor for our soul. Firm and secure. And so my question to you this morning is, are you firm? Are you secure? Are you firm and are you secure? We'll call the band up and we'll close here. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. Come on. Come on. Jesus has entered there on our behalf as a forerunner because he has become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. I'm hoping by now we're starting to connect the dots because we're like, I know who Melchizedek is. I understand what his purpose is. I understand the role of the high priest. You know what? He, Jesus went perfect, holy, blameless. And, and because of that, this hope is an anchor for my soul. Firm and secure. Here the idea is that we are anchored to something firm but unseen enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. I don't know what's going on behind the curtain, but I know it's good. And I know that it's for my good. And so I'm going to anchor myself in this hope. You don't need an anchor for calm seas. The rougher the weather, the more important your anchor is. And I know some of you guys are going through some rough seas. Maybe you're waiting on a promise that God made to you. He patiently waited, the writer of Hebrews tells us. Maybe you guys are experiencing some really, really tough times of suffering or persecution. There's an illness, there's a disease. Maybe it's depression deep discouragement. I I don't know what it is, but but it's in this moment that you need your anchor to be firm and secure. We need the anchor to hold the ship and keep it from being wrecked. Be anchored so that you don't wreck yourself. Be anchored so that you don't wreck yourself. Do you know how many people I know, and I know that many of you know people like this who who started off well, but because they weren't anchored, 
the seas took them left and right and all over the place. But even in that moment, God still speaks. We need to be anchored so that others around us can be safe and secure. A, a ship that's anchored is a safe place for people to board. Are you a safe place for people to be around? So some of you are wondering, you're wondering, why don't I have the influence that God said that I will have? You have all the gifts. It's because you're not anchored. You're not a safe place. Nobody wants to be around you. You're all over the place. But we can anchor ourselves in this hope. Be firm and secure. We need the anchor to allow the ship to maintain the progress it has made. Those who are anchored are the ones who will lead us. And that's just natural. It's natural to look to those who are anchored to go, you know, I'm going to follow that person. What we're saying is, follow me as I follow Christ. The, the, the problem with many of us is that it doesn't look like you're following Christ. You've anchored yourself in culture. You've anchored yourself in relationships. You've anchored yourself in titles and accolades and money. And so it looks really cool in the beginning, but because those things cannot promise you what God has promised you, over time, it starts to get a little shaky. And even in that moment, instead of going, you know what, I need to hold on to Jesus, you go, what's the next thing I can throw my anchor to? I'm here to tell you now, none of those things will hold you. None of them. If you are anchored in Jesus, people will look to you and go, that's, that's the man and that's the woman that I want to follow. There is something there. Even, even the person who does not believe in Jesus yet, they'll look to you and go, there's something different about your marriage. There's something different about the way you handle your kids. There's something different about how you think about money. There's something different about how your, your emotions, how you, you use them to navigate life, and, and they're not a savior. There's just something different about you, and I want it. And what's our response? Jesus is the anchor of my soul. And I can give you some steps and I can give you a, a program, I can give you all these things and they'll, they'll help you for a little bit. But what Jesus wants for you is eternal. I'm gonna close and say this. What we must remember is that we are anchored upward in heaven. Not down in the ground. And also we are anchored to move on, not just to stand still. You might be in a season where it's like, I feel like I'm just, I'm not moving, I'm standing still. It's because God's doing some work in you. Holy Spirit's doing some work in you. But know this, it's so that you might move. So that you might move forward. And so I'm going to close with the great words of Charles Spurgeon, who says this. Stand still. In the midst of chaos, in the midst of uncertainty, in the midst of confusion, stand still. Keep the posture of an upright man, ready for action, expecting further orders, cheerfully and patiently awaiting the directing voice. And it will not be long before God shall say to you, as distinctly as Moses said to the people of Israel, go forward. And so Rooted Fellowship, my hope is that we would be so anchored that we might hear clearly from God when he tells us to go forward. The greatest adventure of our lives is before us. But if we are to experience it, we must be anchored firm and secure. And so we're going to stand and respond in song. And if you know, you know that you are not anchored. You know 
that you're all over the place. Just for a moment, just, just, just be still. Be still and know that He is God. And then cry out to Him. Whether it's the words that you see on the screen or whether it's your own words. Like David, sometimes we need to tell our soul, hey soul, get in check. Recognize that we stand before a holy God who is beautiful and glorious, who demands perfection from us. And though we cannot give it to him, we're still able to stand because Jesus gave it to the Father. And my hope is that you would be anchored. It really is. My hope is that you would be anchored so that you might experience the abundant life. Don't miss out. Don't miss out on what God has for you. And so would you stand with me? I'm going to pray and we'll sing in response. And so Father God, I pray for every single person here in this room. Father, I pray that you would meet them where they are. All of us are in desperate need of a Savior, and His name is Jesus. Jesus, we need you for our salvation, and we need you for our sanctification. God, the only reason that we can hold on to you is because you are holding on to us. And so we trust you. God, I pray that you would break any strongholds here this morning. That you would release your children from fear. For we have not been given a spirit of fear. And so Holy Spirit, come and do your work in us. We, we, we lay it all down before you and say that you are, you are our everything. We've sung it, but now we want to live it. We want nothing else but you. Every single promise that we find in Scripture has been made yes and amen in Jesus Christ. And so if we doubt, if we ever doubt, Father, help us to see the finished work of Jesus, that He is no longer on the cross, He is no longer in the grave. Jesus, You are seated at the right hand of the Father. You pray for every single person in this room by name and by circumstance. You know what they need. And so meet them where they are. In Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Amen.